May I please have everyone's attention? May I have, please have everyone's attention? A meeting of the Upson Historical Society is now called to order. Before the regular meeting and the program, the society members that are present tonight are going to have a vote for a two-year term of office for the fourth constitutional office on the board here of this uh, thing. These are the executive committee recommendations and uh, they are listed on the, let me get out, get over here. Got myself Joe Gazafi for the president, Gary Gill for vice president, Ms. Wanda Renfro for treasurer, and Ms. Linda Hallman uh, for the secretary. And at this point, do we have anybody that wants to make any nominations from the floor? Okay, no nominations from the floor. All in favor of this slate, aye. Opposed? On behalf of the society, we want to welcome everyone to the meeting and program. Do we have any visitors here tonight? If we do, please raise your hand and introduce yourself. Any visitors? <laughs> yes, yes, sir. We know that. Well, go ahead and introduce yourself. I'm John Carter. Okay. <laughs> and this yes. is my wife, Susan Carter. Hello. Hello. My name yes. is Keith Reeves. I'm a member of the Thomaston City Council. Thank you. We want to welcome yes. all the visitors and extend an invitation to everyone to join the society, get our newsletter, and participate in the activities. We have applications on the back table. We accept donations at the back table. We have books for sale, and in the archives we have more books, shirts, and other things for sale. Does anyone have any special announcements at this time? I do. Uh, we are having open house at the PWS house this coming Saturday. It'll be from 10 to 4, and we're going to have a ribbon cutting for our new sign and our new World War II exhibit at 11 o'clock. Did everyone hear that? An open house this Saturday at the PWS house. And we said, did you say you're going to see about the African American Museum being open yes. simultaneously? Yes. And what did you say the times will be? It will be from 10 to 4, and the ribbon cutting is at 11. Okay, and so the museum would be open those hours as well? Yeah. Okay. Right. The museum, if you've never been there, you need to tour that, take a look at that, and the PWS house, so you can have them both open Saturday. We have our programs now are on YouTube, and we have DVDs of past programs that are available. Do we have anything else that needs to be brought up before the program? Anybody got anything else that we need to need to bring up before the program? Okay. At this point, I'm going to turn the program over to Mr. Gary Gill. Mr. Gary Gill will uh, introduce the speaker. Thank you, 
you, Mr. President. Uh, again, I'm glad to see everybody here. Uh, we do have uh, membership applications in the back, and we would love to have you in this organization. We have meetings just like this every month, except during the summer, and uh, we think they're all good and all worth uh, coming to uh, listen to, including tonight. So, I will explain to you what tonight's program is about and a little bit about how it came about. Um, I'm looking ahead all the way down to this the biography here to the very bottom. If you recall, uh, February the 15th was proclaimed uh, Dr. John H. Carter Day in Thomaston by the mayor. And that week, he was visiting here and being interviewed by Mickey Thrasher at Fun 101 radio station. And I went there. Uh, Mickey told me he would be there. So I went. He was uh, seated being interviewed by Mickey, and some of that interview was put on Fun 101. And it was at that day, that very moment, that I approached him about doing this program, and he accepted it. And so uh, but Mickey had advised me that he was going to be there and he might make a good program. So that's how this program came about. And so tonight's program will be presented by Dr. John Carter on his newest book, Hold My Mule. And Dr. Carter, you told us that the book has not gone through printing yet. Is that correct? Okay. Do you have any idea when it will be? They keep promising me. Hopefully, in the end of the month. Okay, we know how that is. They keep promising. But be on the lookout for uh, if, if you're interested in that, um, because I'm sure it'll be published locally in the local media if you're interested in that book. Dr. Carter is a native of Thomaston and former <coughs> vice president of AT&T. After Dr. Carter retired from AT&T, he managed a successful consulting firm, Carter and Carter LLC. He also served as an adjunct professor at Strayer University and worked as a course developer and seminar presenter for the nonprofit university. Dr. Carter earned a Bachelor of Arts from Morris Brown College, a Master of Human Resources from the University of Utah, a Master's of Management from the University of Southern California, and Doctor of Business Administration from California Coast University. He served on various boards over the years, including the American Red Cross, American Lung Association, Georgia Business Roundtable, National Minority <coughs> Purchasing Council, and many others. Dr. Carter also served as the initial project manager for the Washington, D.C. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Project <coughs> Foundation, Incorporated. He has been recognized with numerous awards from the community such as the Morris Brand College Alumnus of the Year, 1992 Alpha Phi Kappa, no, Alpha Phi Alpha, State, Regional, and National Brother of the Year, Who's Who in America, Alpha Phi Alpha President, Presidential Award of Merit, Bell South Services, Presidential Award of Excellence, and more. In February of 2022, Mayor J.D. Stallings presented a proclamation to Dr. Carter recognizing February 15th as John, Dr. John H. Carter Day in Thomaston. And with that, I will invite Dr. Carter to come on up and, and give us his program. So come on up, Dr. Carter. Come around there and watch the wires. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you, and let me uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, in fact, uh, it was 10 years and two days ago uh, that I spoke to this group uh, about my, my journey. And I'm always uh, intrigued uh, when I hear uh, an introduction like that because I'm always thinking, who are they talking about? <laughs> but, uh, and I, I was also very, uh, uh, somewhat intimidated when, when you're asked to speak at your hometown. Um, it's always uh, difficult to come back home because you're here with people who know you. Um, and then also, I was a little intimidated when I was asked to speak about me. And um, how do you do that without bragging? But then I did some research 
And I looked at the old um, website uh, that uh, used to be on the website of the Historical Society. And it said, if we are to understand the significance of preserving the records of the past for the sake of the present and the future generations, we must be willing to share our experience with others. And as I think about that, and I have to tell you, you've inspired me in so many ways. Inspired me to write my book of my life, uh, which is called Hold On You, There's No Such Thing As Can't, which hopefully again will be out by the end of uh, this month. Uh, they told me the end of last month, but we will keep trying. But as I get into my presentation, I'd like to, uh, to start with a short uh, uh, story, uh, a vignette, uh, if you will. Uh, it's a story about a cliffhanger. Uh, and this was a cliffhanger who was determined to reach the summit of the highest mountain. After years of preparation, he began his adventure. Only he journeyed alone because he wanted all the glory. He didn't want to share it with anyone else. So as he began his ascent, and as the daylight faded, he decided to continue to climb, and night continued to fall. The night felt heavy. The moonlight and starlights were hidden within the clouds. And eventually, there was zero visibility. He was only a few meters away from the summit when he slipped, climbing a ridge and fell off, falling at a frightening speed. While falling, he could only see the shadow-like figures in the darkness and felt the tug of gravity sucking him down. Can you imagine? He's there alone. It's dark. And he's falling. And in these agonizing moments, he saw his life passing in front of him. And of course, he thought death was near. And then he saw, felt the rope tightening around his waist that was tied to a nail in the side of the mountain. In desperation, Suspended in midair, <coughs> he screamed, God help me please. And you imagine, it's probably what all of us would say, God help me please. We don't only wait and hope we get a response. In this case, a deep voice from heaven responded. And he said, what would you have me do? And the person hanging from the rope said, save me. And the voice came back and said, do you really think I can save you? And the man hanging from the rope said, of course, my Lord. Hanging from the darkness, the voice had one other reply to him. He said to the man hanging there, alone, from the mountain, then cut the rope. There was a moment of silence. Then the man tightened the rope tighter around his waist. To make a long story short, The next day, the rescue team tells a story of finding a mountain climber hanging from a rope, the rope tied tightly around his waist, and his hands tightly around the rope, two feet from the ground. So I will use this vignette to tell my story. And in doing so, I want to just give you three points. 
and then I'll be gone. First thing I'd like to talk about is I didn't do it alone. And secondly, I often slipped along the way. And thirdly, unlike the man hanging from the mountain, sometimes I listened. <laughs> and I hope I listen more often than not. I like the Thomas and Upson archives. Uh, my goal since 2000 has been to uh, document my family's history. And I tried to go back as far as I possibly could. And as you know, when you're researching the history of African Americans, it's difficult to go back beyond uh, the uh, late 1800s uh, because there are not any uh, good records uh, and also because African American men uh, did not have last names, or the women didn't have last names either. And when you had a will, the men, the name of the men was not listed. Uh, they were listed as property in the will. The name of ladies were listed, but only their first names. And the names of children under 10 were listed in the will. So in 2000, I compiled the first edition of my family history, which is the basis for my book, Home on Mute. And you will, and hopefully I'll have again that book uh, shortly. In doing my research, I was able to trace my family back to a slave woman, Julia, and her infant son, Seber. Julia was my great, great grandmother, and Seber was my, was my grandfather's dad and my great grandfather. My mother grew up in, in, Tom, in Tarleton and Taylor County. And like your organization, there's a member of Taylor County, uh, Mr. William H. Davidson, the former state legislator, I understand, compiled a history of Tarleton County entitled Rockaway in Tarleton Travels in Old Georgia Country, County. Very good book and really gives a lot of history and a lot of wills. My family originated from the Alexander King Leonard Plantation. And I understand that this family is probably uh, related to several of the members of, the, uh, of Thomas Lynn today. And I'm currently researching that to see who, that, who those family members are. My grandfather took the name, this is the, and you've probably seen that mansion You've probably seen that mansion if you've gone into Tarleton. And my grandfather took the name of Matthews. It was traditional for slaves to take the name of the plantation where they were. And it appears that they were on the plantation, the Lennon plantation, but they took the name Matthews. In my research, I found that uh, Leonard married a, a one of the Matthews sisters. And in Prasburg, and you'll see that sign still in Prasburg, and the Prasburg store is there. My mother recalls going to that store as a child. And in fact, they call uh, the uh, Leonard House uh, the old plantation. My mother recalls uh, going to the back door with uh, her father uh, to, get, to borrow money and also to collect uh, the money from the sharecropping that my father did. When the uh, elder Leonard died on April 1st, uh, 1860, he left his property to his wife and children. And of course, at that time, um, slaves were considered property. Listed under the inventory and apprisement of slaves was a woman named Julia with the infant and children, Mary, Nelson, and Seymour. Susan and I were in uh, the, the uh, library in uh, Tarleton, researching our family history, and she, she uh, hollered loudly, uh, I found him. And fortunately, Seaburn has a unique neck, and so therefore we were able to see him listed there, and of course he also had to be under 10. Seaburn was appraised um, at, this is Seaburn here, And he was appraised at $1,250, 
1860. So you might ask, how can I be only three generations uh, from slavery? At the time of the will, Seaburn had to be under 10 years old, or less, otherwise he would have been listed as a man. He took his second wife, Phoebe, in 1897, and they had only one son, my grandfather. Seaburn had to be 60 years old when my grandfather was born. Apparently, Seaburn took his second wife um, in the late 1890s. He was in his 60s, and she was around 19, 20, although younger because she did not die until the 1950s. <coughs> Otis and Sarah, my grandfather and grandmother, sharecropped on the old Leonard Plantation. And actually, at my grandfather's death, he owned most of the land that he sharecropped on. Otis and Sarah had 13 children. <coughs> my mother was one of those, and my mother could be with us tonight, is, is currently 93 years old, still living in Johnston. Um, and my grandfather had 66 grandchildren. 141 great grandchildren, 130 great great grandchildren, and and I sort of lost count of the great greats. I was up to 50 the last count, and I'm sure it's still going. Uh, my mother uh, moved to the big city of Thomaston uh, when she married my father on January 4, 1948. Uh, she said it was the most frightening experience of her life. She had never been out of. Uh, uh, the Carsonville section of Target County. And when she came to the big city, she was frightened to death. My mother, uh, who is in her uh, early uh, 90s, as I said, is a pillar of strength. Uh, I'll never forget a cold, rainy night in the early 1950s. We lived in a section of Thompson called Redskin. It is now the place where the, the library is, uh, and there's a big church on the hill there. Were right behind them was called Redskin. And in the middle of the night, in the probably around 54, uh, there was a big tornado that came through. And it actually took the roof of the house off. And just my mother and my sister and I were there. And I recall my mother taking my sister in her arms and holding my hand. And we walked about a mile up to the, to the resident of a, an older lady with a big fireplace roaring. I'll never forget the big fireplace. And I, my mother never shed a tear. I never heard a cry loud. She was a pillow strength and still is today, 93. I often have to tell her to slow down when she's walking because she just likes to move very fast. And today I stand on the legacy of my ancestors who endured the hardship of, the, of those times in an effort to make it better for future generations to come. And so I can clearly stand here and tell you I did not climb that mountain alone. I can also stand on the legacy of the great men and women of Thomaston, Georgia. Uh, I will be forever indebted to Mr. Peg Daniel, who gave me my first job at 14 in the Ace uh, Cleaners as an alteration board. I would, on Saturdays, I'd take the alteration around to the different men's stores and bring them back to the altar and take them back and forth. Later on, I worked for Miss Frances Pinkins at the Frank the Pinkins uh, grocery store. Uh, I probably delivered groceries to probably some of your homes or your grand, uh, your parents' home uh, in Thomaston on a great big bicycle uh, riding around Thomaston. Of course, there were teachers in Lincoln Park. And um, there was an interesting report in the uh, Upson Deacon recently, uh, uh, around February, that talked, it said, and had the little dot dot, so it means there was more, but it said that, uh, that Robert E. Lee influenced me. Uh, Robert E. Lee, I've known that Robert E. Lee for a year, um, but I was influenced by a lot of folks in Thomaston, especially uh, Lincoln Park Elementary School, uh, Mr. Monroe Worthy and, and Mr. Uh, 
banks, uh, for, for the Drake High School, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Uh, Johnson, who mentored me and made me understand that I could be something other than a worker at the Thomas DeMille. No offense, Mr. Hightower. <laughs> <laughs> and who could forget Mrs. Gray? Mrs. Green, the English teacher, who let us all know, and Mallory can remember, she let us know that if you're going to march, you got to get past me. And she didn't just let us know that one day, she let us know that almost every day. So I did not do it alone. You were Thomas to help to guide me while I'm today. I also want you to know that I slipped. Just like the cliffhanger, I slipped along the way. Uh, as I have made presentations throughout the United States and the world, actually, I'm often amazed uh, when people come up to me uh, to congratulate me on being blessed and having had a privileged life. I've uh, often, uh, and I'm quick to remind them, that I grew up in a four-room house with a family of five children a mother and a father, and no indoor plumbing. I'm humble. I'm from Thomaston, Georgia. However, we were always taught by our parents that we could do all things through Christ who strengthened us. We were poor, but we didn't know it. And one of my biggest ambitions in high school was to be president of the student government at Drake High School. It was a prestigious uh, a position. We had Vesper every Monday and Friday, the boys would wear suits and ties, and the girls would dress in high heels and, and stockings. And we would have a guest speaker uh, that would come in and talk about the values uh, of the world, often encouraging us that we could do things more than Thomas the Mills. <laughs> and, um, but, and at the end of that presentation, the president of the student government would always give a response to the speaker. I ran for president of the government, and I won. And, uh, and of course, the last speaker of the season would be the president of student government. So while I won uh, in uh, April, I started preparing my presentation for the next year uh, because I really wanted to be ready. Uh, I could see the top of the summit, and I couldn't wait for my senior year to begin. Because I had really almost reached the summit. However, who would have thought that someone would mandate the opening of the Robert E. Lee Institute to members of all races in 1965? And let me make it clear, no one made me transfer. The community did not have a big meeting to decide who the students were going to be. The students and their parents had to make their own decisions. In fact, my, fam my father was very opposed to my going and actually refused to sign. Um, the class, it took two weeks into to the class before my father would finally sign the paper after another father talked with him. Of course, I was 16 years old. Didn't even think about the adverse reactions that could have happened and consequences that could have happened to my family and to my young siblings. At the time, I had a brother who was a year old, another brother in first grade, and a sister uh, in high school. My parents could have lost their jobs. Fortunately, Thomas Dunn was not that kind of community, and nothing happened. While almost at one summit, I saw even a greater summit uh, ahead of me, so I took the opportunity. I elected to transfer in an effort to not only pave the way for future generations, but to pave a, a way for myself. I remember watching Dr. King's speech. Uh, I have a dream speech with my mother. And I said to her at the end of the speech, I hope he doesn't accomplish it all before I have an opportunity to help. <laughs> and I saw this as an opportunity for me to help. Also, I saw this as an opportunity for me to advance my education. You see, at Drake High School, we only received secondhand books. Uh, there was always somebody else's name written in the books that we received. In chemistry, 
we only had one Bernson burner, and the instructor had to do all the experiments. And much to my surprise, when I transferred over to Robert E. Lee, there was a science building. <laughs> Robert E. Lee had a boys and a girls gym. We only had one little gym. It was one of the most difficult experiences of my life, and yet one of the most rewarding. As many of you, and I'm sure anyone that came to Robert E. Lee and Ms. Green, would know that she all had us to read Tell the Two Cities. Anybody didn't read Tell the Two Cities? <laughs> she all had us that. And it said it was the worst of times and the best of times. It was the worst of times for me because can you just think back of your senior year. You see the students not going to their prom. Uh, you see all of the exciting things uh, that the students did. And to be at Drake uh, as president of student government, a big man on campus, was something I was really looking for. And to give all of that up, uh, and to just give up all of the fruits of my labor to do this. You see, it was the worst of time because there were only three black seniors that year. And for us, it was just the opposite. Um, at Drake, there were 18 seniors total. At Robert E. Lee, there were old, almost 300. And we took two classes with the top 10%, as we should, because the grades reflected that. And all 17 superlatives were in our class. However, we were not invited to any social events. I remember that the homeroom classes, they did, they did plays at the end uh, at some point. And each class had to do a play. And take place uh, was the play that my class selected. And take place had done something. It was unusual at the time in the 60s. They had a black police officer in the play. So I raised my hand to the class and said, I'd like to volunteer to play the black police officer. I never heard anything else about that. <laughs> <laughs> the students wouldn't talk to us. Uh, they wouldn't sit with us at lunch. However, uh, I had one of my classmates come up to me 30, 40 years later and said, you know, I apologize for the way that you just said, you know, we thought it was funny. Uh, we actually laughed about it. Uh, uh, one time we decided when we came out of the cafeteria line that we all were going to go in together and then we sat at a different table. So we all sat at different tables so everybody would get up and move. <laughs> so, um, but we were there for the learning. We were there for the education. So it was the best of times because the circumstances caused me and us to grow as students and as individuals. I also learned something about humanity. I will never forget the kindness shown to me by a student by the name of Faye Price. And I've been, it's been 56 years now I guess, since we graduated. But uh, Faye Price, uh, my first day in this green class, I didn't have, and I came, I came two weeks late, and I didn't have a copy of the tell what you sent it. I didn't know I was supposed to have one. Of course, that didn't stop Ms. Green from berating me. And Faye Price said, he can use my book. And I saw humanity there. I saw it also. Um, I also saw it in the teachers. We were, we were, we were somewhat behind. But there were individuals like James Baskin and Eugene Rogers who offered to tutor us for free. And they came in early. We came in at 7 o'clock in the morning. And we would stay after class. And they would help to tutor us to help us get through. I saw humanity coming through. And of course, I have to tell you, the teachers at Drake High School also tutored us as well. And I, I'm sure you all can attest, Miss Green also made me a much better writer and instilled us the value of reading and to read and use proper grammar. I remember uh, my sophomore year, I came back home. Came back home, and of course, the tradition was you would go visit the classes. And so I went to Miss Green's class, and Miss Green says, What did you get in B in, uh, in English in your freshman year? And I said, I got a B. She said, What kind of school is that? <laughs> You have to know Mr. A to know it was funny. <laughs> Stephen King, great writer, said, talent is cheaper than table salt. What separates the talent than individuals 
from the successful one, it's a lot of hard work. And I can tell you that CBI I work harder than I've ever worked in my life. And I almost slipped. I was, but I was determined that I was going to make it. One of my favorite books is a book called The Road Less Travel. And the author is H. Scott Peck. When my children were young and in elementary school, I made them learn the first paragraph of that book. And I want to give you that, and I hope you'll remember it as well. I'm going to give you that first paragraph. The first paragraph of that book is, life is difficult. And we can remember that. That life is difficult. It wasn't meant to be easy. It was meant to be tough. You were meant to slip. And so, when you slip, you got to get back. My last point is on like the clip hanger. I also try to listen. The lesson was pointed out to me time and time again because I worked on the MOK Memorial in Washington, D.C. When I received the proposition to head this project team to move them Martin Luther King Jr. project forward, I was uh, again at the pinnacle of my corporate career. I was a vice president of Del South. I had three or four years to retirement or early retirement, and I had the responsibility for 14 lines of business, had a budget of almost a trillion dollars, and managed over 7,000 employees in the United States. And you, as you can imagine, there were few black officers in the corporate ranks in corporate America in 1996. Let me tell you, when they first came to me, I know who I said no. <laughs> uh, in fact, I said no three times. Now, on the last occasion, I asked my bosses at Bell South if they would support me in the endeavor, and to my surprise, they gave me that full support. Now, you see, I said I came to move the, the, the project forward. You see, the first phase of the project actually started in 1983, 13 years before I got involved. When George Seeley and his wife, Pauline, were sitting at their kitchen table in Civil Springs, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, D.C., and were looking out at a blank wall, they saw a city that was 70% African American with no memorials honoring an African American. That is when they saw Over the Mountain Peak and birthed the idea to build a memorial to Dr. King in Washington, D.C. And in January of 1984, Mississippi presented the proposition to the National Board of Alpha Fraternity Alpha Phi Alpha. The board accepted it. The, the board initially uh, rejected the idea. And of course, Celia and Bailey never accepted the word no, they went back and talked to them and they actually accepted it. But they clearly did not see the possibility. After all, there were no memorials to African Americans on the mall, and basically all memorials were to president. So Alpha gave them that support, but gave them no money or manpower. So here you have two men in their 60s. So they began to personally lobby They began to personally lobby Democrats, uh, Democratic congressmen, and later enlisted Republican Congress uh, people as well. It was amazing once we got involved in the project to walk down the halls of Capitol Hill with them, or the, or, or, or the Capitol building with them. Um, these two senior citizens, uh, everyone knew them. All the secretaries knew that name. The janitors even knew who they were. These guys were there in Washington every day for 13 years. They lobbied, they wrote letters, they made calls, and remember now, you didn't have any computers or emails. They were mainly, and their wives were very involved in this project as well, typing letters, uh, calling people, all at their own expense. Of course, they didn't have free long distance calling. They were in Maryland, so they were calling DC. And some years they would get the legislation all the way through, through one house, but not through the second house and they would have to start all over again the next year. 
And then, in, in November 12, 1996, the legislation finally passed and was signed by President Clinton. And it gave Alpha Phi Alpha the authority to raise funds for the memorial. Now remember, this memorial, this piece of legislation, which is the first one, requires that you have a memorial anywhere in Washington. And as you know, there are memorials all over Washington, D.C. Okay? And, but while there's no African, memorials to African Americans uh, on the mall in Washington, and the mall we're talking about where the Lincoln and the Jefferson World War II memorials are, Vietnam. But ironically, the first memorial to an African American was elected in Lincoln Park. I thought that was not neat since we have a Lincoln Park here. <laughs> but there is a Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. It is west of the Capitol. And it's a statue of Mary McLeod Thune handing her legacy to two young students. It's a beautiful memorial, very moving. Uh, but it's miles away from the, the, the National Mall. Has anyone ever seen it and going to Washington? Most people don't even know that it's there. I didn't know it was there until we did a review of all the memorials. However, you have to have that first piece of legislation before you can go to the second piece. So as the Board of Alpha Phi Alpha began to look at uh, the legislation, there were two things that became clear. Number one, this is a mammoth project, and we needed professional leadership and management to, to move it forward. Number two, a memorial to Dr. King had to be on the mall. It could just be some plaque somewhere. In fact, there was one guy who wanted to put a plaque on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, which he finally got. And that was going to be the memorial to Dr. King. But they finally saw the young wall, and, and after 13 years of the legislation being passed, that's when they came to me to ask me to head the project team for this project. And so, let me take you to 2006, jump ahead a little bit, November 13. Here, I found myself on an outdoor stage in Washington, D.C. on a cold day, on November 13. I sat there witnessing the groundbreaking ceremony for the MLK Memorial. I could not reflect, could help but reflect on the events that led to that all important day in American history. Imagine me, a little boy from Thomasville, Georgia, who grew up in a, a four-room house with no window plumbing, on a stage with dignitaries such as the President of the United States, George Bush, former President Bill Clinton, or Clinton and future President Barack Obama. There were CEOs from major corporations in America, to include the CEO of General Motors and um, Tommy Hilfiger. There were Hollywood stars um, who only, you, you only know them by their last names, like Oprah and Judge, and movie stars like Morgan Freeman. And of course, all the civil rights leaders from the movement were there, John Lewis, Andrew Young, Al Sharpton, Dorothy Hyde, and Reverend Jackson. And it was amazing to see that this is exactly what we predicted. We predicted, as we were working on this project to get us to here, that we'd be in the back row and that all these dignitaries were in front, but it wasn't about us. It was about building a memorial to honor the man, the movement, and the message. You see, there were tears on that day, and many of the same people who were crying there, and you see it in this picture except for Eddie Young, would not even return our calls prior to 2000. We sent letters. We called. They wouldn't talk to us. Not because they didn't care, but because they could not see the vision. Here you're talking about a bunch of an African-American fraternity raising millions of dollars to build a memorial to an African-American man on the mall. You see, life has a way of not letting people see what is right in front of their faces, or just two feet under their foot. They were still holding on to the rope. So how did I get involved? So here 
this little boy from Thomas, Lincoln Park section of Thomas Town, who is charged with bringing this manner and historic project to reality. I did it using all three of the points that I'm making tonight. I did it with the help of others. I, I, I faced difficulties head on and conquered them. And God was clearly on our side. We often said there is divine intervention happening here as things would happen as we moved along. First of all, Bell South supported the project and me wholeheartedly. In fact, Bell South was our first sponsor. Bell South provided uh, staff expenses and all the travel support for me throughout my involvement in the process. In fact, the first website for the project actually ran on the Bell South website. Realizing we could not climb that mountain alone, we also began by looking into the fraternity's membership to form a project team of experts from various fields, uh, IT, PR, legal, and finance. And of course, we brought George Seeley and Al Baby on to handle the governmental liaison. Once the team was formed, we set about developing a project strategic plan. Also, I uh, failed to mention one very important member of our team, and she's not, I don't know if she's in that picture or not, was Susan Gibson Carter. Because Susan was uh, really the executive secretary of the project, if you will. She would, when calls, when something would happen, Reporters would start calling me from all over the world. And so we'd be getting calls from, from London and from, uh, from, from France, from all kinds of places. Reporters wanted to interview me, and she would then be taking down the numbers. She would actually travel with me up to the uh, DC Memorial and work in the project office once we got a, a staff. So both of us were actually working the project, as we've done everything we've done. <clears throat> but let me tell you, that I've never built anything, uh, not even a house. I, I've always bought existing houses. Needless to say, I knew nothing about building a memorial. I am on the street strategic plan. And my first step, task was to sit down and develop an initial plan that would outline what you would see outside of that wall. And our first difficulty was the National Park Service who actually controlled the land. So you have to go through the park service, and they told us that it's a 25-step process for developing a memorial. They also told us that we got really lucky in getting that first piece of legislation passed in 13 years. They informed us that it would take us at least 15 to 20 years to get the second piece of legislation passed, and another 40 years to get the third piece passed. And they gave us the examples of the Lincoln Memorial and the Washington Memorial. You know, during the Civil War, the Washington Memorial was halfway built. And you see pictures of it. It was half built, and they, had, they didn't build it until afterwards. And the second piece of legislation would, would be authorized, would authorize us to have the, legis the memorial on the mall. Remember, the first said, anywhere in Washington, this brings us on the mall. Close to the reflecting pond, close to the Lincoln, and all that. But there's another catch in here. You don't know, get close to that mountain and then you slip. The mall is divided into two sections area one and area two. Area two is it's on the outskirts of the Lincoln and, and the Jefferson. So we have to go back and get all three of them. In addition to that, there are three commissions that you have to go through. The National Capital Memorial, the National Capital Planning, and the Commission on Fine Arts. Those commissions made up of, of appointees meet once a month. And each one of them have to approve the identical thing. So if you select the site, the first one has to approve it, the second has to approve the exact same site, and the third one. If anybody Denies you, you have to start all over again. So you are going back and forth. And they only met once a month. And then the next part of that is getting legislation. Can you imagine what it takes to get a piece of legislation from concept to the desk of the President of the United States? It involves getting the legislation through both of the houses, Senate subcommittees, you know, 
Thompson, Georgia, Fordham House. Never thought about going to testify before so I could be in Congress. And I'm a businessman, I'm not a legislator. Um, and then you've got to get into the desk of the president. Well, let me tell you that we cut the road. Through 90% of planning and a lot of strategic planning and stuff and things happening simultaneously, we were able, and with God on our side, we were able to get that second piece of legislation passed in 15 months. 15 months from the five time we started to the end. And on the desk of the president. And frankly, without divine intervention, I don't think we could have done it. Then we headed back to the park service to discuss the third piece. And they said, guys, you guys are really lucky, but you know, it's going to take you a long time to get the next piece of legislation passed. Of course, we didn't listen. We kept moving. And it did take us longer than the first piece. It took us 18 months to get the third piece of legislation passed. So we finally got everyone. But again, there's a lot of slip in there. The next, and there were a lot of obstacles. And one of them, the most important obstacle was the King Fan. Now, you'll have to wait for my book to uh, obtain all the details regarding this relationship, <coughs> which was turbulent at best. Uh, but I can tell you, initially, it was not bad. It was pretty good. Uh, we met with Mrs. King. We explained it. Her husband, of course, was a member of our fraternity. And she uh, relaxed and told us stories about her husband attending fraternity events in Atlanta. We took some pictures, and this is one of the pictures we took the first day that I met with her. And she assigned Isaac uh, King Ferris, her, her um, Dr. King's nephew, uh, to, to join our project team, and who's part of our planning effort, and actually appeared before Congress. Because one of the things that, uh, was one of the secret sayings that everybody had, is that nobody wants to be the one to slay the widow. So nobody wanted to do anything that would hurt Mrs. King or the King family or the King legacy, or to interfere with the fundraising of the King Memorial in Atlanta. And so we were very careful uh, to uh, work with them. And so we tried to get the family's input in all stages. After a lot of work, we were able to get, after looking at a lot of sites, we were able to get a very small and less than after uh, we got a uh, four-acre site on the title base. Now let me tell you that they tried uh, very hard to push us to a, a very small site between the Vietnam and the World War II Memorial. And our position was that Dr. King was a man of peace, and we definitely did not want to have a memorial for him in the middle of memorials to war. So we, after a lot of work, we were able to get this memorial. And let me just tell you, show you, hey, has anybody been? You see the memorial? I, if you haven't, I highly recommend it. It's very fascinating piece. And this is the, this is the Jefferson. And one of the things I found is everything in Washington is symmetrical. So if you are in the White House and you look out the Jefferson room, you will actually see the Jefferson Memorial because Jefferson designed the White House. And Jefferson is on a direct line with the Lincoln. And you got the Washington right here. So what we were able to obtain, the site that we were able to obtain, which was really very difficult to get as you can imagine, because along this is the title basis, you only have presidents. And there was a desire to hold this site for Ronald Reagan. At the time Ronald Reagan wasn't eligible for a memorial because you have to be deceased 25 years. So we have to fight to really get this. But there's a lot of significance to this memorial because it's on the direct line between Jefferson and Lincoln. And the symbolism is, is that initially on the base of this was going to be the promissory note. The promissory note came out of the I Have a Dream speech. And the promissory note says that the Declaration of Independence, reading from it, 
It says all men are created equal, not just some men. Lincoln, Jefferson wrote that. And initially, on the memorial, on, in the hand of Dr. King was going to be a scroll. And that scroll was actually the Declaration of Independence. So the similar symbolism is Jefferson wrote it. Because King didn't want America to do anything it didn't say it would do. Jefferson wrote it. Lincoln fought for it. And King died. And so everything in DC has a symbolism. And when we were able to get that site after a lot of fighting, um, it was, again, divine uh, intervention. It is a, 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 a very um, a calm, it's, it's facing the tidal basin, which actually makes the four acres look even more so. Now, most people, did anybody know what verse, uh, where the, the, the I Have a Dream book came from? Remember uh, uh, what book of the Bible that I Have a Dream book came from? Remember Dr. King was preaching? Came out of the book of Daniel. And Daniel says, out of the mountain of despair will come a stone of hope, and justice will roll down like water. So the symbolism here is that this is the mountain, and out of this mountain, when you walk through, is that stone, and Dr. King emerges out of that. And Dr. King's picture is facing the statue of Jefferson across the water. And the tidal basin just expands that memorial. We also wanted to have open spaces so that people could gather. We wanted this to be a memorial of peace and contemplation. Uh, when you go, just walk around and listen to people talking. Talking about their experiences. Listen to young children talking about their experiences of peace. Um, it's what this, uh, this memorial was designed uh, to do. When I think of this uh, memorial, I, I am reminded of a painting that hangs in the Lincoln bedroom of the White House. It's called Waiting for the Hour. It's a painting uh, by William Tobin Carson. It's painted in 1863, and it depicts slaves waiting for emancipation on December 31, 1863. And you would think that with this major accomplishment now, we've got the site. We've got the legislation passed. You would think that uh, a retiree uh, could go play some golf. And in fact, at this point, I decided to take her retirement. And for the last year of 2000, I actually spent my time working on the memorial full time. And you would think after accomplishing all of this, I would be able to retire. Well, I couldn't because we hadn't finished. The next step on it was you got to get a design. Now remember, we got to site, but we hadn't gotten to this great design I just showed you. We had to do a design competition. In fact, the day that they approved the site, the very day we got approval on that site, we sent our specifications. And this is how we were moving. We had it all planned on the project plan. So things fell in place. So that very day, we went to the post office to mail out our design specifications. And we thought, OK, we'll get 100, maybe 90 to 100 uh, applications. Well, let me tell you, we were wrong. We had over 1,800 designers and architects from 52 countries to indicate that they were going to send in their design. We received 900 submissions. Now, <clears throat> what are you going to do with how you get those, nine, those 900 down to one? It was very difficult. Each uh, submission had to be on a four by four board. So what we did is we rented the MCI Center which is a basketball arena in D.C., and that's what you were saying. And that's all of those memorials. When you walked into that arena, 
it was like those those uh, those panels were reaching out saying select me, select me. And there were some very innovative designs. Um, anyone that's been to Africa, you know that one of the things when you when you go into an African village, um, you you are to put a stone on the pile of rocks that you come in. Um, that was one of the submissions. That what you would do is you would just people would come to the DC and they put a stone on a big stone pack of rocks, and that was going to be the more. They went from that to other to elaborate designs. Uh, so in order to decide the final stage, we assembled uh, a panel of judges from around the world, uh, from India, China, Turkey, Mexico. The American Institute of Architects actually selects a gold winner every year as the architect of the year, if you will. And so we selected those individuals to come in. And we also got some architectural professors from American universities to come in and help us as well. And then we had uh, Yolanda King, Dr. King's daughter, and Aunt Andrea Young, and the young daughter to come in to help with the final submission design. And the Roma group was the group that actually came up with that final design of uh, there. Roma group is out of San Francisco, and they, def they designed the waterfronts in San Francisco. So they, know, they knew something about public spaces and how to design them. Now, remember, we haven't built a thing at this point. All we've been doing is, is planning <coughs> and stuff. And also notice that I hadn't talked anything about money. And any major, major founder, fundraising endeavor to start asking people for money is not the first thing that you do. People have to be able to see. We didn't have the design. We didn't have the site. We had no idea. We couldn't even do anything <coughs> until we got the site. And to, to begin, we got the design. So during this four-year period, the project was funded by two entities. My wife will tell you it was three entities because we did put out a lot of our own money uh, because El South paid my expenses, but they didn't pay hers. So we had actually paid for her to fly out to D.C. Uh, and when we go into restaurants and uh, the, cut the credit card for the foundation wouldn't work, I'd just pull out mine and pay for it. Uh, <clears throat> but our first sponsor was Bell South, as I indicated. They covered all my expenses. Um, and even after retirement, they continued to cover uh, uh, my expenses as well. The other was Alpha Phi Alpha. The fraternity, as you know, King was initiated to Alpha in 1952. Therefore, we developed um, uh, the strategy of asking each undergraduate, our college brother, to contribute $52, and each graduate to, to contribute $150, and each chapter contributed $1,052. Some contributed a lot more. Um, our, our, we, were, we also came up with a commemorative brick that we gave them. Um, to, uh, for their donations, we raised over $2 million from Alpha Phi Alpha that really sustained us for this project. Our first real corporate sponsor, however, came from um, Tony Hilfiger. Uh, I, I was actually in the project office in DC, and I was, I was still living in Atlanta now. I'm flying back and forth to DC once, sometimes two or three times a week, depending on when the uh, uh, missions, uh, when the committees or uh, commissions will be. And I was in the, the office, and I received this call from this lady. Said, um, I can't introduce myself, but we have a donor who is interested in contributing to the project. Are you interested? I said, Of course. At that point, we had absolutely no money at all. And again, divine intervention. We flew to DC and met with the Hillfinger Foundation, and they pledged the first $5 million that came in. Uh, and then uh, the other thing we tried to do is to have positive media. We wanted to make sure we had positive media constantly. And so we hired a media firm to assist us with this. And they said, we have one of our major corporate donors who would like to contribute to the project. They introduced us to General Motors. And General Motors agreed to come on board and give us $10 million. And this now gave us the funds that we needed to begin uh, of the project. <laughs> During the final uh, phases of this, uh, we changed uh, uh, U.S. presidents and also political parties. Now, let, let me hasten to add that all three pieces of legislation were passed and they were bipartisan efforts. Uh, but we realized that on January uh, 2001, the administration was changed. So therefore, we put, up, uh, we put a plaque on the site. 
because we worked too hard to get that site for somebody to come and take it away from us. So I used to tell my students when I was teaching, and I told them, said, it's not bragging if you if it's, it, it's not bragging if it's true. So we decided to put the name on there. I tell people I'm the initial project manager. My name is on there. And that actually applied now is at the Smithsonian. Uh, they moved it to the Smithsonian. And having set the foundation in place um, and raised the first $15 million I could finally see the golf course waiting for this retiree. And I did not want to move to Washington, D.C., although they offered me that opportunity. So we set up a permanent staff to coordinate the fundraising and the building of the memorial. It was headed by attorney Harry Johnson, a member of Alpha Alpha. And he, he, it took his, he and his team 11 years to raise the $105 million required to build the memorial. This included raising the money as well as a building the design, working with the commissions. Just having a design competition complete was not enough. You had to work with them, they changed the wording, you had to approve the font, they had to approve everything. So Harry actually moved to D.C. and coordinated that. And the final, as I said, the final des uh, uh, dedication in 2011, just a few rows from uh, President Barack Obama, and I reflected on all the sacrifices that Julie Seymour, Otis, Gus, and Rosa uh, helped get me there today, this little boy from a four-room house there. I thought of the possibilities that are available to our young people because of one man who dared to stand tall and cut that rope. Who listened? As my son and grandson stood on that historic day, I fully realized that the America that those slaves dreamed about on May 29, 1865, two years after they were emancipated, by the way, uh, in Thompson, that it is indeed possible. Is it possible to become a, because of a man named Dr. Martin Luther King who had a dream? A message, a peace that inspired the fall of the Berlin Wall or the Russian dictatorship and of late the fall of dictatorships in Yemen and in Egypt. As you reflect on the journey, as you reflect on this journey of building this final memorial, on the Mall in Washington, D.C., to honor a man of peace, a non-president, and an African-American. Please know that this journey was made possible by the vision of a simple husband and wife sitting around the dining room table. I want you, the members of the Thomas and Georgia community, to know that you also had a part in this history as well. It was you who taught me that I could not do it alone, that I must cut the rope, and that I must trust in God his angels to help when things got difficult. I also thank you for preserving the history of our dear city. And because of you, when a young boy walks to the courthouse square and sees those 11 memorials you have, and all of them are to war. In fact, three of them are to civil war. But because of you, if they just walk right over here through the archives, they will know that through you, that you helped through me put a memorial on the wall, on the mall in Washington, D.C., to a man of peace, a man who stood for peace. As I close, I thank you again, Thomas for and Richard my life. I thank you for helping me to climb to the tallest peak. And lastly, I thank you for allowing me to share my experience with you so that together we can preserve the records of the past for the sake of the present and future generations. And hopefully, one of these days, my book, Hold My View, There's No Such Thing as Can, will be out, and I'll be able to share even more of my history. Again, thank you for inviting me. This time, does anybody have anything you'd like to ask Dr. Carter? You want? Um, we will be, you know, we'll be around. You mean feel free to mingle for a little while. I'm gonna be here.
there for a while. I got to put up equipment, so you you don't have to rush away. Um, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Carter for a very interesting program. I've learned things. Um, I think I've put two and two together and figured out why the Daniel House was called the Daniel House. Uh, that the big house behind the dry cleaners with the columns, the big red brick house, um, it's always been called the Daniel House. Now, could that be that the Daniel family lived in it, that ran that dry cleaner? No, I'm not. I wonder about no, that. Yeah. Back there. It goes back further? Are you thinking about the back there? Well, I always heard it. Maybe I was wrong when they told me it was the Daniel House, but I saw a program one time uh, uh, a uh, slide program one time, and they the called it the Daniel House. House. I thought, well, that must be why. It was but the Atwater House. It was the Atwater House? Okay. Daniel Atwater, I think, built that house. Uh, who built I think Daniel. 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 Well, you might could wear this hat. We're going to give you a hat. Oh, wow. Man of appreciation. Oh, look at that. Thank you very much. Uh, the garden, you may, it has an adjustable band. All right. Uh, it matches a suit. I wear that properly. Yeah. All right. And, right color. And Dr. Carter, you're a member of the society. You're an honorary member of this society if you're not already in it. Um, so thank you for coming. And uh, we're adjourned now but uh, like I said feel free don't forget the White Steps House in the African American Museum opened this uh, Saturday for some open house come by those